Good morning. Good morning. Listen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen yes, and today uh, we are reviewing our timeline. Periodically, we need to go back and see where we are in the book of Revelation. So your timeline is on the newsletter, and it's also on page 225. Today, I'm going to introduce to you the, the three woes of Revelation chapter 9 and it will uh, and then we're going to see where those three woes fit in the timeline. So that's why we're reviewing the timeline. So be sure and look at that on page 225 and Chase, Chase on the title of it, make your title the three woes of Revelation uh, chapter 8, all right? The three woes of cha Revelation chapter 8. So look at, looking at your timeline, the very first event is this present age. And this is Roman numeral 1 under the timeline. It's the present, what is our age called? The age in which we're living. Church. The church age. When I was a little girl, we all, not only called it the church age, we also called it the age of grace. grace. Yes, because today is the age of grace. We're living under grace and we need to be so thankful. We're not living under law. We're not living under judgment. We're living under grace. And so the present church age, it's only recorded in the New Testament. It, it is a secret in the Old Testament. And Jesus alluded to it in the Gospels. But it was not revealed to us as a great mystery until Paul wrote to us in the books of Romans, uh, Colossians, and Galatians. So those were the revelation of the church age is given to us. The history of the church, the beginning history in the scriptures is given to us in the book of Acts. It's called the Acts of the what? Apostles, and you read the whole book, and that's what it is. It's the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the second part of the church that is given to us in the New Testament is the doctrine. Listen very, very carefully. Doctrine means right believing. It's what God wants us to believe. And we get our doctrine not from the Old Testament, not from the Gospels, not from the book of Acts. We get it from the epistles. That is what we are to believe. That's what we learn from Paul, that salvation is by grace. It is not by works. That the church is a mystery now being revealed. We are the body of Christ. Those are the doctrines that we believe. One of the most important doctrines that is given to us in the epistles and in Romans through Jude is the doctrine of the resurrection. That is so important and that's only alluded to in the Old Testament. Paul builds on that and he, he expands on the doctrine of the resurrection. And number three, the prophecy of the New Testament is what book? Revelation. Revelation. So that's the genre. Of the, of the New Testament. The Gospels. You say, well, you left out the Gospels. The Gospels is the hinge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's, it's what happens to give us this New Testament doctrine, which gives us who we are as the church. So it's not the history of the church. It's the coming of the Messiah. It's the coming of the King and the and the. Israel rejected him. So these are the three things in the New Testament about the present church age. All right? Now, letter B. How long has this present church age existed? How long? 2,000 years. A little more now. Maybe a little less. 2,000 years is really good. In fact, we would start at 33 A.D., at Pentecost up to today, 2022. That's the church age. It hasn't ended yet, right? Mm 
This is the age of grace that the, that the book of Romans through Jude tell us about. The initial event of the church was the day of Pentecost. And that's the day that we teach as the day the church was what? Started. Or born. Yeah. It was born on the day of Pentecost. When does the, when does the church age conclude? When's the ending of it? Just as there was an event at the birth of the church, so also there is an event that concludes this age of grace. What is that? The rapture. The rapture, the rapture of the church. And so let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Because I want us to really look at this event. This is a moment in time, a second in time event. There is nothing in the scriptures that um, tells us it's going to happen. There are no signs of the rapture. There are lots of signs of the, of the <coughs> re tribulation, but there's no sign of the rapture. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I'm going to read it to you because we need to read this all the time, don't we? And, and Paul is talking to the church of Thessalonica. And the church at Thessalonica uh, was in the city of Thessaloniki. Where? Where is that? In Greece. It was flooded with temples to foreign pagan gods. Flooded. They worshipped gods in the extreme. They loved their pagan gods. They worshipped them. The occult, magic, all was related to these gods. And, and they, but they had no hope. There was no afterlife for these pagans. So let's look at that. Verse 13. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant. Ignorant means without knowledge. Okay? So don't be without knowledge about those who have fallen asleep. Those who have died in Christ. When you see the words fall asleep, in the scriptures, it's referring to those believers who have died. Okay? And he says, don't grieve like everyone else about those believers who have fallen asleep. Don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. In fact, one of their temples says, those who enter here have no hope. That's what their temples would say. Verse 14, we believe, and I've circled that word and underlined it, and I highlighted it, because this is the doctrine that we are to believe during the church age. This is what we believe, that Jesus died. Do we believe that? Yes. Do we believe that Jesus rose again? Yes. And therefore, he says, so we what? Believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Pastor Ken McGee's service this week just touched me because of his life. And it says, and so I just keep thinking about him. Because when he went to sleep, we know that Jesus one day is going to appear and wake Brother Ken McGee up. According to the Lord's own word, according to Jesus, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, that is those people who are still alive at the rapture will not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will do what? Rise. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that beautiful? This is our great hope. After that, we who are still alive and are left, uh, left will be caught up, raptured, together with them in the clouds to meet that is in his glory, in his Shekinah glory. We will be caught up with them in God's glory, in the glory of Jesus to meet the Lord where? In the air. In the air. And so we will be how long with the Lord? 
How long? Forever. Oh, forever and forever. Therefore, terrify each other with these words. <laughs> Is that what it says? Yes. Never. Don't terrify people with these words. There's some other words we can terrify them with. What do we do with these words? What's the scripture say? Encourage. Encourage. Comfort. Build up. Strengthen. Believe the believers with these words. Isn't that exciting? All right. So. We're going to listen to a song that they sang at Pastor McGee's service. It's called The Midnight Cry. Now, the one thing I don't like about it, it's the midnight cry. There's nothing in the scriptures to say it's midnight. I think some people who wrote this may have written it to terrify people. But it's not. We are to comfort one another. But it's the most beautiful song. And it uses these words. Are you ready? ready. Lyndon, can you turn her up, honey? And, and, and Doug, back there, get the lights, please. And we're going to just worship God here for a moment and comfort one another with the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians.
think that midnight cries is talking about the time of day. No, I don't mean that. No. What do you think it's talking about? Time the end of the t- the end of the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a reference. I think he, I think she's right. It's a reference to the end of the age. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Doug. It'll be midnight somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Doug. I don't know what I'd do without you guys. He said it's midnight somewhere. (laughs) Yes, Kevin, help us out. Help Doug out here. Honey, I think it's too loud now. Chase, can you turn that down? Thank you, darling. Kevin? I think the only thing that I saw in that song that uh, that doesn't line up with With scripture scripture is he says that the father's going to tell the son, go get your children. No, the father's going to tell his son, Go get your bride. <laughs> or your church. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not the children. You're exactly right. Go yeah. get your children. I'm not sure it's the bride either, but we'll discuss that another day. But, okay. But you're right. And furthermore, it's not when he comes again. It's his appearing. Okay? <laughs> so we don't want to tear up that song, though, because it's just too beautiful. Because it is so powerful and gives us such great hope. All right, so the rapture signals, and I'll, we'll talk about that someday, Kevin, about the church and the, and the bride. The, but the rapture signals the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. So when people who know the scriptures from us who teach them, uh, they're going to know when all of us disappear that the tribulation will begin very, very soon. And so that's, you will find the tribulation all seven years in the chapters of Revelation 4 through 18. Alrighty? So, um, and that's B, number one, two, and three. Okay, number one, the initial event of the church age is what? Pentecost. Pentecost, Acts 2. The concluding event is? The rapture of the church. And remember, I've asked you and asked you, when you want to talk to people about the rapture of the church, where do you show them in Scripture? Because you can't say it. You cannot say it as powerfully as the Scriptures give it. What, Timothy? 1 Thessalonians 4. 13 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4. 13 through 18. And 1 Corinthians 15. The greatest chapter in the whole Bible on the rapture of the church and the change that we will be going through. All right, so, um, and this event signals the beginning of the seven year, what? Tribulation. Now let's look at your timeline. You see the present church age. And then at the bottom of that, you see the rapture of the church. So under the present church age, right 2,000 years. So that you'll know that it's at least 2,000 years plus. Then there's the rapture of the church. When is that going to happen? We don't know. We don't know know the time, the hour, anything about it. Now then the next seven years you will see are the years of the tribulation. At the very bottom of that timeline you see the arrow. The years of the tribulation. How long is that? Seven years, and it is full of events. So I'm going to show you some of those right now. The first three and a half years, this is letter A of Roman numeral 2. These first three and a half years of the tribulation, Jesus calls them what? The beginning of sorrows. sorrows. It's just the beginning. And then let, it's going to um, Revelation chapter 6 and 8 tell us about the opening of the seven judgment seals. That's number one under letter A. Revelation 6 and 8. Tell us about the opening of the seals. And John, remember how John was so concerned that no one was worthy to open the seals of judgment? Who did he find worthy to open these seals? Jesus. Jesus is the one who is worthy. But you go back to those passages and study those. Now, number two, Daniel tells us about a treaty that the Antichrist makes with Israel. That is the beginning event. 
of the tribulation. That is the first apocalyptic horse with the rider on a horse, on a white horse, meaning he's coming in peace. He has a bow with no arrows. He's coming in peace. And this is when he makes a treaty with Israel. The Antichrist does. That points to the beginning of the tribulation. People will see that peace treaty. There is no way that we're going to be able to make a worldwide peace treaty with Israel and with their enemies. That's just not going to happen in our era of time. But it will happen. That's what will bring him his great acclaim. Because he will have made a peace treaty with Israel and her enemies. Wouldn't that be amazing to see happen? And so that points, however, to the beginning of the tribulation. That's number two. Number three is Revelation 7. What am I telling you? I'm telling you right now all the events that are happening, that will happen in the first three and a half years. That's what I'm telling you. I forgot to really make that clear. So we will see that the first thing that happens in those three and a half years is the, peace, is the opening of the seven seals. That's judgment. Will be the peace treaty of Israel. We'll also see in chapter 7, in this first three and a half years, that God calls the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. When he picked, when he called out Israel as a nation, he said that this nation would be a holy nation, a nation of priests, which would tell the whole world about God. Well, they didn't do a very good job, did they? In fact, they killed their, the Redeemer, their Messiah. Um, but in the tribulation, we're going to see the rise of Israel and we're going to see that is the Israel, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists who proclaim the testimony of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Isn't that exciting? And um, they are sealed. That mean, doesn't mean they're put in an envelope. But God imprints upon them his seal saying, these are my people. These are mine. I, they are, it shows ownership. It shows protection. Now, some people say, and I don't know, I, I can read it both ways, that these 144,000 will be protected throughout the tribulation from martyrdom. They'll be, they'll be abused and persecuted, but not martyred. Other people say that the protection is also is the what because they can go to heaven because you see the the we are sealed as well right we are sealed by the holy spirit also it's an internal seal and but we are protected by god we're going to make it to heaven because we are sealed yes. um, but it doesn't mean we won't go through troubles and tribulations right so there's not a real agreement among Bible students as to whether any of these 144,000 will make it entirely through the rapture without dying or they many will die. We don't know. But they're sealed by God and they will be getting to heaven. Okay? That's the story, I think. Is that okay? But this happens in the first three and a half years. The calling of those evangelists. It's a sign of ownership. It's a sign of protection. Number four. Also during these three and a half years, angels announced the first four of the trumpet judgments. We have the seven seals. You read chapter six. You'll read about the judgment seals. Now when you get to chapters uh, eight, you will read about the Four trumpet judgments. There are seven. But chapter 8 gives us four. Let's just look at chapter 8 of Revelation. And I'll show you what it is. Aaliyah came over to my house this week. And she was listening to... What show were you listening to, Aaliyah? Jeopardy. Jeopardy. She said, Grandma, I, 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 under, I got an answer right on Jeopardy. Because she said, I've been studying the Bible. What was the question? Real loud. What instrument seven angels had? And she said, trumpets. trumpets. And she got it right before any of the other people did. Give her a hand. Yeah. We're so proud of you. 
<laughs> what? Show me the money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the four of seven, there were seven trumpets, there were seven angels, each one of them had a trumpet, each one of them blew his trumpet. We're looking at the first four, because the last three are very important. What chapter did I say? Chapter 8, this is the trumpets. Look at chapter 8, verse 6. The seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Now what they are doing is announcing judgment. Verse 7, the first angel sounded his trumpet. Hail and fire mixed with blood were hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees and all the green grass was burned up. That's pretty bad. Verse 8, the second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain all ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. What do you think that could be coming out of the sky like that? Asteroid? Okay. Verse 10, the third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star or a meteor blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. His name was Wormwood. Wormwood is a plant that's very, very bitter. So the water turns bitter. You can't drink it. Many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Look at the water now is being destroyed. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet. And this is the celestial bodies. You see here now we haven't touched human bodies. It's just from the people will be dying because of the of the events on earth and now the celestial events but there's no attack on a human body yet but we're going to see some more a fourth angel sounded his trumpet and the third of the sun was struck a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them turned dark a third of the day was without light and a third of the night these are the first four trumpet judgments and we're going to find that angels will say, holy and just are these judgments. Why? Because these people have rejected God. He has shown them grace and mercy. He sent out evangelists throughout the world telling them about Jesus Christ and they reject it. In fact, um, let's look at what they did. No, we'll do that in a minute. All right. That's the four seven trumpet judgments, number four. On your notes, angels announce four of the seven what? Trumpet judgments. That's still the four of the, these four seven trump four of the seven trumpet judgments are still in the three and a half years of the uh, beginning of sorrows. Revelation eight. Uh, 11. We see the testimony and association of the two witnesses. This, we've studied all of this, haven't we? I'm just reviewing this for you so that you can remember it because I forget. Be but the, the, four wit the two witnesses testify for three and a half years. And are they accepted by the people? No. They are mocked. They are ridiculed. They are shot at. People try to kill them. Um, and they just keep testifying and they can do marvelous miracles with... They, if you, somebody tried to shoot them, they just shoot fire out of their mouth and destroy that guy. So they're pretty powerful men. We don't know exactly who they are. People have their own philosophies and theories as to who they are. The scriptures do not tell us. But they are two witnesses and they are killed by... Uh, by some, some of the people in Israel. And the Antichrist is so hateful at this time that he says, don't bury them. Just let them lie out in the streets of Jerusalem. 
The scriptures tell us that the whole world, the whole world will see their dead bodies lying on the streets in Jerusalem. And the whole world rejoices. It's like Christmas. They bring each other gifts in celebration of the death of these tormentors. Consider them tormentors because they kept talking about the judgment of God and to believe in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and they hate them. What happens at the end of three days? They were resurrected. They rise up and ascend into heaven. Guess what? The whole world will see that. Isn't that something? Now, if you want to read about this, read Revelation 11. All right, let's see what this happens at the end. That resurrection, by the way, happens probably at the end of the three and a half years of the beginning of sorrows. Are you keeping up with why I'm going back over this? These are the events we've studied. And these are the events that happened in the first three and a half years. Teresa. Where are you? In 11, verse 7, talks about the beast. Am I on 11 yet? No. Yeah, we just... Okay. Their bodies will lie in uh, the abyss. The beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. We're going to read about the beast from the abyss, and we prob think that is probably uh, a demonic angel or Satan. Right. Okay. So you're saying that that is who killed him. Right. Okay. I had forgotten, forgotten that. Thank you. Look at verse uh, 11, verse 7. When they have finished their testimony. That's really cool right there. You see, God is not going to call any of us home until we have finished our work. You all have a lot of work to do. So, uh, when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. All right. That's the two witnesses. Read on there. That's really good. Verse number six. The uh, desecration of the temple. Uh, the desecration of the temple is also called what? The abomination, of desolation. the abomination of desolation or the abomination that causes desolation. This is when the Antichrist has his image put in the temple, Holy of Holies, and requires everybody to worship him. The scriptures tell us that that happens at the end of the three and a half years. That's Daniel 9. It's Daniel 9 that tells us this. That he will put his image in the temple, require the whole world to worship him at the point of death. If you choose not to, fine, you die. But you have only two choices in that time. You either follow Jesus Christ or you follow the Antichrist. Guess what? Today, we only have two choices. We either follow Jesus Christ or we follow the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist today. So, um, at the desecration of the temple or the abomination that causes desolation. That's Roman, Roman letter, Roman numeral 2, letter A, number 6. These are the events that happen in the first three and a half years called the beginning of sorrows. Does anybody have any questions about that? That's a lot of stuff. Terry. I have a question on, okay, so we had the rapture, and you had the 144,000 uh, evangelists left. Do they know that they are dead? They have an actual seal on their forehead. God sends an angel there and he says, seal them. It's an, and you know what the seal is? It's the name of God and the name of his son. Yeah, it's just as vivid as the seal would be of the, of the Antichrist with the 666 the, or the, uh, the beast, the mark the of the beast. The Antichrist would know who these are. I'm sorry? The Antichrist would know who these are. Yes, yes he will. And everybody's going to know who they are because they're out preaching and teaching the word of God, the gospel. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you for that question, Terry. Now then, letter B. The, what signals the... Um, letter B. The blank of the peace treaty and the blank of the temple by the Antichrist signal some things. Let's look at that. All right, well now we are at the 
see where it says on your timeline, in the middle of the tribulation, the desecration of the temple. That's right at the end of the three and a half years. It's the dividing line. It is the desecration of the temple that, uh, and the violation of the peace treaty that signals the end of the beginning of sorrows. Right? The desecration of the violation of the peace treaty and the desecration of the temple all by the Antichrist will signal the end of the beginning of sorrows. The end of those first three and a half years. So if it's the end of the first three and a half years, it will be the beginning of what? The great tribulation. The next three and a half years called the great tribulation. So the tribulation is divided into two parts. Seven years, and the first three and a half years are the beginning of sorrows. All the events that I just told you, most scholars agree will fit in there. But we're really not, not gonna, we're not going to die on the sword on that, okay? But we do know what's, what concludes that three and a half years, and that's the violation of the peace treaty according to Daniel 9, and the abomination that causes desolation. And from then on is the great tribulation. A horrible, horrible time. So let's look at that. That's letter B. The, si the violation of the peace treaty and the desecration. desecration of the temple by the Antichrist signal what? The end of the beginning of sorrows and the what? The beginning. the beginning of the great tribulation. Look at me. <laughs> I th I'm, there is not a total worldwide consensus among scholars that this is correct. This is as good as I can get it. Okay? And when you study with someone who's actually gone to college on teaching the Bible, they're going to get into such great depth it's going to drive you crazy. Okay? But this gives us all a great outline to begin. This is just the beginning of the understanding of the book of Revelation. Okay? Alright. Number three. Roman numeral three. This is where I wanted to be today. This is when an angel announces the three woes. So if you would look again at chapter uh, 9, at the trumpets, verses 6 through 12, we heard about the first, second, third, and fourth angels and their trumpet announcements, right? Now what comes next must be a very frightening time, and John sees this in his vision. There are three woes that are announced. It goes like this. The angel says, woe, woe, woe. That is a three-letter word meaning terror, horror, agony, torture, terror, terror, terror. Aren't you glad we have that song of the midnight cry? Because you see, we won't be here. We won't be here. The three woes. So, we've done the uh, first four trumpet plates. Revelation 8. Now, verse 13. Be sure you're in your Bible. Verse 13. Then I, John, heard a warning from an angel. Listen, God does not leave people without warnings, without calls, without knowledge. And now he's warning the whole world. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair call out in a loud voice. So it's an eagle or an angel. He's flying in the air. And the whole world can see this. And he's calling out in a loud voice. Read it with me. Woe, woe, 
Whoa. Whoa. Meaning terror, terror, terror to the inhabitants of the earth. Everyone on the earth can hear this cry of the eagle or an angel to the, all the inhabitants of the earth. You say, well, how can the, all the inhabitants of the earth see this and hear this? Well, we know how, don't we? Don't you know? When my grandfather was a Baptist preacher back in the 40s and 30s and back way back in the 50s and 60s, my, my dad's father was a preacher. And I read this now and think, how did he even believe the scriptures, you know? Because there was no way for the first 2,000 years that this scripture was written that anybody could understand how the whole earth could hear this woe, woe, woe. How the inhabitants of the earth could, but now we can. And I just thank God for those people through all these years who believed it without understanding how it could happen. Yes, ma'am. Lavanda. Well, if you think about that the whole world considered that Middle East around the Mediterranean Sea, all the countries and everything. Okay. Yeah. So what? So you're saying it would be easier to understand? Well, I mean, if you look at that time frame of what they considered the whole yeah. world. They did consider just what they call the Levant, Middle East, and Europe, the whole world. Yeah. Okay. Beca okay, he says, woe, this eagle says, woe, 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 to whom? The inhabitants of the earth, because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded. We, not, we know from reading the scriptures that there are three more trumpets to be blasted, don't we? David. You're going to have to be really loud. Oh, does it? Okay. More common, we can understand terror, can't we? Yeah, it's interesting that the United States has a war on terror right now. Ooh, that's good, a war on terror. So it's coming. It's coming. This, yes, that's right. What we're doing today is just a foreshadow of what's to come. All right. Uh, about to be sounded by three other angels. So now we know three more angels are going to be trumpeting more announcements. And they are announcements of terror. Terror, terror. So that's number three, letter A. After the first four trumpet plagues toward the end of the first three and a half years, John heard a warning. Number one, what does it say? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Or? Terror, terror, terror. To the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the Trumpet. trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. We're right at the midpoint of the tribulation. Number two, woe implies a state of intense hardship or distress. When we think of terror, hardship or distress. When we think of woe or terror, we think of intense disaster and horror. That's letter A. Now then, that's number two. All right. Got that? Now let's look at these first, these three woes that are to come. Now it's really important that you understand this as you read the scriptures. The first two woes occur right at that midpoint of the, of the tribulation. Right at the end of the beginning of sorrows. Right in there. Somewhere. Okay? The third woe is very interesting because the third woe lasts the entire three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. It's not just one event. It's like the other trumpets at the first four events. Um, the last three and a half years, the third woe are the events of the Great Tribulation.
The events of the third woe last throughout the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. It's a time of hardship, of terror, of distress, of horror, a horrible time. And that's number two, A and B. The first two woes occur toward the what? End of the beginning of sorrows, right in the middle point. The third woe lasts throughout the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. Now let's look at the, th at the uh, three woes. Letter B. Closer look at them. <coughs> Revelation chapter 9. We've just read chapter 8. Um, the first four woes. And then the eagle or the angel who flies in the air calling out, Woe, woe, woe. Chapter 9 verse 1. What are we looking at? Chapter 9, verse 1. Look at that in your Bible. What's it say? Fifth. The fifth angel. So this is the fifth trumpet. Everybody got your Bibles? Looking at it? Okay. All right. This is the announcement of the first woe by the fifth angel. Got it? The first woe is announced by the fifth angel. And now let's read chapter 9, verse 1. Kevin, are you okay with your... You have a question there? Because you're looking with a sconce at your book. No? Okay, good. When y'all look confused, I get worried. All righty. Are you confused? Can, now, Jamel, I can't, you cannot ask me questions. You're too hard. <laughs> ask me a question. The beast comes out of the bottomless pit. Yeah. In the, fifth, in the first woe. Yeah. So it comes out of the bottom when they open it. Let's read it. Okay. All right. Now this is very interesting. The fifth angel sounded. What did he sound? <laughs> and I saw a star from heaven. Now I made a mistake sort of here. On your number one at the bottom. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star. Mark out the word another. I mean it is another angel but really it, we're going to find that it's Satan. Okay? And we know that uh, Isaiah talks about Satan falling from heaven, right? We know that Jesus said, I actually saw Satan fall from heaven. So this is this star falling from heaven. I saw a star. Mark out the word another and just put Satan there. Would you do that? Not that. Which had fallen to the earth. So we know Satan fell to the earth in Ezekiel 14 and Isaiah 14. If you want to write your notes, put that down there. He fell, for, he fell to the earth because of his horrible, horrible rejection and rebellion against God. The star, who's the star? Satan was given the key hmm, to the shaft of the abyss. Now this is so big, and we can just study this a whole lot, but I'm going to give you a little bit of what I know about it. <coughs> the abyss is what, in the King James Version and how I was taught, is the bottomless pit. It isn't hell, okay? It's not hell. It's a pit. And it says the shaft. That's a big, big tunnel or something to the pit. According to many scholars, and I don't know anything about this. In fact, they say, I think. The scholars, I've, books I've been reading say, I think. Okay? But many scholars will say that the shaft, there's a shaft from the surface of the earth down to the in middle of the earth where a pit is. A bottomless pit. A shaft. It's dark. Uh, and it would be, wouldn't it, if it's in the middle of the earth. And that is where, according to Peter, in fact, write this note down, 2 Peter 2, 4. Just turn over there and I'll show you something. When angels followed Satan into rebellion against God, it wasn't just a minor what we call rebellion like, like January the 6th, okay? 
I mean, it is a re major rebellion, major wickedness. According to Isaiah and Ezekiel, these, Satan was going through heaven, spreading rumors, <coughs> gossip, slander against God. And, and, and a rebellion followed. But look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Many of those angels are, that followed Satan uh, are still out there and have, can roam the earth just like Satan does. But there are some who are so dreadful and so bad that God has kept them bound in the abyss, in the bottomless pit. So let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons, also called pits, to be held for judgment. Well, so in this pit, in this abyss, there are demonic angels waiting judgment. They have been found guilty. They rebelled against God, but judgment is still waiting. And that will happen at another time. Jesus or God or somebody gives Satan the key to the abyss. Whoa! Can you imagine? He gives him the key to the abyss. And at this moment in time, the whole world now will be um, surrounded with demonic angels like we can't imagine. The fury of these angels being held in this pit since they fell in the beginning of time. They're kind of angry in there. Let's read what happens. Got the picture here? Okay, so the star, Satan, was given the key to the shift shaft of the abyss. Who has the key? God does, because he put him there in this pit, right? Page 226. When Satan opened the abyss, look what happens. Smoke rose from it. Like the smoke of a gigantic furnace. Like the smoke of a huge, huge volcano. This is very vivid writing, isn't it? And let's look at how pervasive this smoke is. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke coming out of the abyss. The whole earth was covered with this smoke from this hellish place. It's not hell, but it's hellish, isn't it? And out of the smoke, now this is that fifth trumpet. Verse 3. Out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth. These will find our demonic spirits because if you want the description, I'll show you where to find what they look like. But out of this smoke, out of the abyss, locusts came down on the earth and the locusts were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. Now if you would look at page, I mean chapter 9, we talk about the fifth angel and the sun and the dark, the earth was darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions. Look at verse 7. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. If you look at the head of a locust or a grasshopper, it looks like the head of a, of a horse, doesn't it? Uh, on their heads they wore something like crowns of gold. And if you look at a locust or a grasshopper, its face is almost that of a human. That's what these are looking like. These are terrifying beasts. And their hair was not the hair of a horse, but it was like women's hair. And their teeth were like lion's teeth. It goes on and on describing them. Be sure and read that today, okay? To find out what these locusts look like. Okay, so uh, these spirits uh, were given power like that of scorpions. And so they have the stinging power of scorpions. A scorpion has a tail that comes up like this and around, right? It's a curved tail. 
and it's with that tail that they sting. And it is a horrific uh, agony of, of a sting. They, verse 4, uh, verse 4, they, and who's referring to they? The well, I better read the, yeah, okay. They, the locusts or the demonic spirits, were told not to harm the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree. So these locusts are not touching the earth. What are they, what are they attacking this time? People. 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 Only those people who did not have the seal of God. So these people were not God's people. These are the Antichrist people. The unbelievers who have taken the mark of the beast. And they were allowed and told by Satan to harm them. On their, uh, didn't, who didn't have the seal of God on their foreheads. With me? Do I need to do number verse 4? Okay, let's start at verse 2 on page 226. When he, Satan, Satan opened the abyss, smoke rose from the abyss like the smoke from a gigantic furnace, like a volcano. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts, demonic spirits, came down on the earth and were given power like that of what? Scorpions, Scorpions of the earth. Verse 4. They. Who are they? The locusts. the locusts. Were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree. But only those people who did not have what? The seal. the seal of God. And the seal of God is a sign of ownership, protection, Okay, let's see. On their foreheads. Are we, did we get all that? Yeah. Okay, verse 5. They, the locusts, were not allowed to kill them. Who's them? The unbelievers. the unbelievers. They were not allowed to kill the unbelievers. And you know why? Who's in control of these locusts? Satan. He wants as many live unbelievers as he can have. Right? So he didn't kill them, but he only to do what? Right. Torment, torture them for how long? Five months. Woo, can you imagine? This is just the fifth trumpet. This is something we cannot even imagine, can we? Something this frightening. Okay, let's look at, uh, oh, and the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion. Anybody ever been stung by a scorpion? I have. Yes. Mark? Yeah, I had a full leg cast on, and I felt some stinging sensation in the middle of the night. Got up and turned the light on, because I kept feeling this horrible sting. Turned the light on, and a scorpion crawled up out of my chest. <laughs> whoa. Whoa, yeah, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad feeling to be stung by It is. I, I stepped on one one night. Okay. And it doesn't just once. You feel the sting at least a couple of times. It's, it can sting more than once, not yeah. like bees. Yeah. I just get stung by lo by the hornets sometimes. And, and I fell and I hit my head on the Ooh. Fireplace. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so y'all, we don't have to... What? He's telling me i got to quit. Yeah. Is there anybody out there? Yeah. The whole church. <laughs> when it strikes, and in those days people will seek death, but they will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Now look at verse 12 on your paper. The first woe is past, and two other woes are still to come. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, Kirk. What is the, this is kind of going backwards about now. Okay, we'll go backwards a bit. So what is the significance of the one-third? So whether it's 
volcanoes from the sea, turning them away, killing a third of the fish. That's a question we need to ask. Yeah, there's threes and sevens throughout the book. of. In fact, it would be fun to go through it and find all the times we talk about a third uh, or sevens, and I don't know. Why, why, what the significance of the third is. A little hint to begin to get your attention. You got a whole number. If you take away the whole, whatever it is, a piece of pie, a tree, or whatever it is, the whole number, you take a third away, what are you taking away? What? 3.3, what leaves it? 666. Six, six. What leaves it? <laughs> oh dear. Here's your little hint. Oh, that is cool. Okay. Save that for next week. Okay. Yeah. If you take a third away, you've taken away 33%. What's left? 66.6%. .6%. 666. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, was this fun today? Yes. Let's pray because evidently Lyndon wants me to quit because people want in here. I don't understand it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that, voice at the midnight cry, we're going home. And those of us who are alive will be changed into glorious, wonderful bodies. And those who are dead will have a resurrected body. Lord, we just can't wait for that day. We say, come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that we know what's coming. Man, we need to be telling people. Thank you for protecting us and giving us the seal of the Holy Spirit upon our lives and upon our souls. Lord, we pray for rain. We pray for rain for our whole country. And we'll give you the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me be your teacher. We'll do the other two woes next week.